Welcome, everyone. Welcome back. Such short, a uh, little short break we got anyways. Had some yummy oatmeal with the uh, family. And got back up here and trying to uh, get ready. So looking forward to our last session. It's amazing. We've already had three so far. We're on our last one. Y'all are quite Y'all are y'all are some real troopers because I don't think we've been under an hour for any one of the sessions. So, uh, thank you so much for uh, just investing the time to uh, to be here and um, and just try to hear uh, and learn um, what God wants to teach you. I know that He doesn't waste anything um, that that we try to do for Him, and so um, I look forward to seeing what He's going to do through you guys' investment of time this Saturday morning and last night. Um, I for sure can't uh, justify you spending time through just my uh, um, what I have to offer you, but I, I'm confident that God will give you something that will be um, something you're able to take away and uh, that he's able to use. So <clears throat> our last session here, um, we're going to finish up lesson 11 and 12 in the Wallwater Garden Handbook as we're going over that. We've been talking about um, how do we plant gardens that reflect the heart of Jesus and allow us to be able to um, serve others and helping them to grow food, but also display the heart and love of Jesus through that while we do it. And the Wellwater Garden is just a simple tool um, to be able to uh, learn how to do that and teach other people how to do that to kind of get us started on that journey. So we're not saying that it's the only and best way to garden, but we just hope it's a nice uh, lasagna recipe for you to get started cooking in a sense. Um, as you're trying to integrate your faith in farming and allow that to overflow as you serve into your community. Um, so we're really going to be talking a lot about how do you share, um, how do you serve others, how do you be a light through your garden um, in this session here. And uh, But first of all, we're going to um, finish up talking about uh, how we are going to take care of the garden we planted. So in the first session, we talked a lot about the heart. In the second session, we talked, uh, well, we cast vision in the first session last night. The second session, we talked about um, the the handbook and kind of how to use it and how it's laid out in the first several heart lessons. And then we talked about um, how to put in a well water garden this morning in, in the first session. And then we um, are now going to be talking about how to use our garden to share with others and how to take care of it. Um, so Lasagna asked, has each session been the same or different? They've been different. They're kind of building on each other. I will have um, the recordings. They're not up yet because I am um, recording them in uh, the um, on my computer. And then I'm going to have to upload them to YouTube to do that. So I will have them up hopefully um, if hopefully the end of today is possible. And um, so, yeah. So as we're letting people get in here, Kelly, you ask if there's a correct direction to lay out the garden facing north, south, east, or west. Um, that's a, a good question in terms of, I think we addressed that in the handbook, what direction to, to face it. But I don't normally, normally in, in such a small garden, um, I don't normally worry too much about certain crops shading other crops or about the lay of the beds in terms of um, the sunlight or the the sun direction, even though that can have a benefit. I'm actually tend to be a little more um, interested in laying out the beds in relation to perhaps how I want the water to drain um, or be caught. So if I'm trying to catch water, I'll, I'll make sure I run the beds across the slope so that it slows down the water. If I have a lot of water running through the area, and I want it to um, to go off of the garden, I'll put the beds going kind of downhill so that the paths will be a drainage to let that water off. But sometimes even more than that, I tend to think of what's visually appealing. I love to look at a well water garden from the ends of the beds. That's where you access it. So wherever I'm you know, wanting to look at the garden and access the garden from is, uh, is typically where I face the beds. Um, so especially when we're putting we're going to be putting one out by our church if i put it where the the one bed is facing the road you can't see the rest of the garden very well wherever the you know people driving by are looking at it i want them to looking at the end of the beds 
that tends to be the most visually appealing. So, um, so yeah, that's a little bit more how we look at where we where we place the garden itself. Um, all right, I'm going to start with uh, this verse and Galatians, um, and this we'll pray and get started. Um, Galatians six nine says, "Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up." And uh, this applies to our garden. It applies to us teaching other people as well. Um, it's always encouraging <laughs> to me when it when it talks about let's not become weary in go doing good because it probably indicates it's going to be natural to feel weary in doing good. So that means don't feel bad if we if we feel weary, but persevere anyways. You know, don't give up, which means I probably will feel like giving up. Um, but if we if we persevere. Um, and then God will bring the harvest at the proper time. You know, you may do your first well water garden class and feel like that's what God's called you to do, and you may have nobody show up, and that is perfectly fine because God is looking at our obedience as a measure of our success, not the the actual like results right away. Those are up to Him, and sometimes He's testing our heart and helping us as we um, and and who we're becoming through the process. And the harvest comes, you know, you're not a bad farmer or gardener just because you don't pick something every day. You go into the garden, right? There's a season of sowing. There's a season of reaping. The same thing's true as we go to teach other people as well. So just encourage you guys as y'all go out to both garden and to share with others, you're going to be tempted to be weary. You're going to be tempted to give up. Um, <clears throat> but we're encouraged here. Don't become weary in doing good for the proper time. We'll reap a harvest if we don't give up. And Lord, we just thank you that um, we can plant and we can water, but you're the one that brings the increase, Lord, both in terms of our physical gardens and just uh, the spiritual harvest that we want to see, Lord, in our own lives and in the lives of people around us. And uh, and we just ask that you would bring about that harvest, bring about that increase, that you would just help us to be faithful, help us to just trust you. We may be... Um, one, we, you, you may choose to glorify yourselves through our stories in different ways. Um, Noah preached for a hundred, a hundred years to his generation, and only his family was saved. And Peter preached for like fifteen minutes or whatever at Pentecost, and three thousand people came to the Lord. And you both were faithful, but you just had different um, things that you had given them to do, or different ways that you were going to glorify their, yourself through their obedience. So help us be willing to let you use us however you want. And bless our last session here and help us to cover the things that uh, you want us to cover. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay. So, <clears throat> planting the garden is actually the easy part. The hard part is taking care of it. We're not going to go into... Um, I'm not going to... There we go. I'm not going to go um, scroll over to the faith foundations for caring for your garden, but I'm just going to uh, share that, um, you know, one of the verses that's interesting is you have this, I, this in Proverbs, it says, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of the man who lacks judgment. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. So the sluggard, it doesn't take a whole lot of character to um, acquire stuff because even the sluggard had a garden, right? <laughs> he had acquired a vineyard, but it was that he didn't take care of it. You know, he didn't have the character to maintain it. So main planting a well watered garden is the easy part. Maintaining it is where not only does it take extra character, but it also is the place where we have an opportunity to shine in our communities in a way that people notice, you know, because something that's well maintained and well cared for uh, displays something about the character of the person taking care of that. So it's important that we focus on that. Um, so in this here, uh, I've tried to simplify the um, care of the garden in a way that it's easy to, to teach and understand. So there's three aspects of caring for our well water garden. First of all, we need to provide what our soil and plants need. Second, we need to protect our soil and plants from threats. And third, we need to pick and preserve the harvest. Three Ps, right? And, uh, and this is actually what I would teach the students um, when, we, when we teach. Uh, we were doing class over the summer with some of the school students. 
is every morning when we would get there, I'd say, I want you to go out and I want you to ask these three questions, the three P's and walk around the garden and say, what is there anything that we need to provide for the plants? Anything you see that they need, water or whatever? Is there anything that's damaging them that we need to protect them from? Is there anything that's ready that needs to be picked? And if we're asking these three questions as we walk around our gardens, we typically can get a pretty good idea of what kind of things we need to, to give it in order to um, faithfully maintain it. <clears throat> so we're going to go through these um, here briefly. Provide for our garden. First of all, there are three major things we need to provide for our garden on an ongoing basis in order for it to thrive. Water, fertility, and support. So water is obviously, you know, an important aspect of growing a garden in order for it to be alive and happy. The nice thing, the good news is that by mulching and not plowing, you've already solved like 50 percent of your watering problems because you're going to have plenty of water in that soil and it's not going to dry out very quickly and it's not going to waterlog as quickly either. So our watering is going to be uh, going to be a whole lot easier if we follow the principles of minimal tillage and mulch. On a 20 by 20, how to water it, you know, it can be as basic as just a hose with a fine spray or a watering can or a bucket with a cup. I mean, anything to get water to it. You know, drip irrigation, overhead sprinklers can work as well, but it's definitely not necessary. And one of the things I'm always trying to do is keep it as low tech and simple as possible because I don't want people to come to my garden, see some cool, you know, contraption um, that I'm using and think, oh, that's the secret to success. You know, that's what I need to really be a good gardener. No, it's not. You know, if you got a watering can, you can be a good gardener. Um, so how often should you apply water to your garden? Just a good, good rule of thumb, assuming you had no rain, is to water two times daily until your seeds germinate or until transplants are well established. And then water one to two times weekly after germination, depending on your climate and season. Um, so they'll need more water in the warm weather and less in the cool season. And again, so a few tips, just water early in the day when possible. And at the base of plants, try to keep the leaves from getting wet to prevent disease. And then just use common sense. I mean, if the water, if the soil is moist, they probably don't need any water. Um, are they happy? Like, if they, so, if they do they look wilty or do they look, you know, perky? And if they look wilty, but the soil is wet, it may be not a watering issue, you know? So like, don't just follow, oh, I'm going to water twice a week, but you're not checking underneath the plants to see whether or not the soil actually is moist enough. Um, if you feel moisture under there, they probably have uh, enough water. Um, but once it's starting to feel a little dry under there, then uh, you'll probably want to make sure that you're giving them some water. So pretty basic stuff for watering, but definitely something we want to pay attention to. Second is fertility. As plants grow, um, they're taking nutrients from the soil. And if we want to, you know, one of the reasons that we're putting back compost and things like that each year is because we're taking produce from the land. You know, we're taking the, the harvest, so we're removing nutrients through what we eat. Um, but even plants that are, so, some plants that are, in the ground for a long time over the whole season, like a tomato plant that might be in the ground for several months, um, it may need a top up of nutrients partway through its growing cycle or halfway through. So um, we can add compost um, four, to six, four to six weeks after planting. We can use uh, these manure teas or comfrey teas or compost teas that we learned how to make that, that, are, that, are, we sh that the compost chapter shows you how to make. Um, manure tea, chicken manure tea is applied at the base of plants. You don't want to put it on the leaves, and but it supports leaf growth. Um, comfrey tea, or you can use sunflowers, um, and you're basically brewing a tea. They're applied on the leaves or at the soil to support um, fruit production um, through the potassium in them. And then compost tea is adding the living organisms of compost without the organic matter, and they can help benefit and promote general health of our plants when we apply them. So I have a, just a basic, you know, I suggested application schedule for that fertility, but that's something that we might need to add. If you notice a plant getting yellow, um, it might need some extra fertility. And then support, pruning and trellising. There's things like pole beans, snap beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, that often we trellis for more production and we prune. And that's something on a regular basis we'll have to say, um, you know, we'll have to, to maintain. Um, I have a, a simple frame like this and for my garden is just several posts. Um, with a bar strapped to, you know, like a, another post or a um, uh, piece of wood or some pipes uh, to the top and then some strings hanging down from it. And that allows me to trellis um, any crops and they're the exact length of a bed so I can move it around from bed to bed each year, depending on where I need it. 
So that's provide. So then the next P is protect. There's three major threats we want to protect our garden from. First, weeds, plants that steal from our plants, pests, things that eat our plants, and weather, destructive heat, cold, and wind, like we're going to have next week here in Alabama. So weeds are a plant, they're often a noxious plant that grows in poor soil conditions, but they can also be a good plant in the wrong place. Um, one of the worst weeds is a plant of its own kind, which means the worst weed for a corn plant is another corn plant because it uses everything like it eats everything that that other corn plant needs. Um, so that's where thinning is really important. But prevention is the best weed strategy. That's by not tilling. We're not bringing up new weed seeds into our well water garden by putting mulch down. Um, we're covering that soil where they don't sprout as readily. Um, and those that do come through are going to be weak and a little easier to pull out. Um, so weeding on time is important. Don't wait till they're waving at you across the yard to weed them. You know, hunt weeds. Don't fight weeds. That's the key. OK, um, you want to be going out there and trying to find the weeds that are there and get them when they're that size, then waiting till you have to battle them. Um, in a well water garden, you can use a hoe for most weeds. Um, but you can also just pull them out and use a bucket to take them out. And remember, creeping grasses and weeds, you need to have a no tolerance policy. That means pull them completely out, try to get the roots as you can, and uh, and remove them from the garden. And do not add them to the compost pile. Put them somewhere far away where you don't mind that they grow. And then pests and predators. Um, there, we live in a fallen world. Um, and so we're going to have, you know, nothing's ever going to go perfectly, but we also just live in a world where God's designed, there are creatures that are designed to eat the things that we grow. Um, and in some cases, uh, a lot of the bugs and pests are targeting our plants because they're sick and weak. And they're kind of, their job is to go eliminate weak and sick plants from creation so that there's only healthy plants left. Um, so a lot of us farmers become experts at all of our sides, like killing things, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, where we really become experts at its death. Um, and there is a time to take life <clears throat> for protection or provision, but I believe that the best way to, to fight a lot of these imbalances where our gardens are getting eaten is through um, increasing life, increasing diversity, fighting life with life, um, bringing in uh, predator insects, uh, and promoting... Um, uh, birds and uh, bringing in more plants and not just having a monoculture, those kind of things where it feels like um, that's a lot more consistent with who God is to fight, you know, death with life than to fight um, death with just more death as, a, as our only tool. So we're just going to talk a little bit about some of the strategies for pests and diseases. You know, um, <clears throat> first of all, a few management principles that we can follow, because a lot of it are sickly plants and pests are a uh, a, a result of our poor management. So let's, or management issues we can we can change. So let's focus on crops that do well in our region, rotate our crops, maintain diversity, increase or encourage strong and healthy plants through good management. Sometimes it's like, I don't know why my plant is not doing well, but then, you know, if we're honest, you know, we let them almost die in the, in the seedling tray before we set them out or something like that. And they had some stress point earlier on in their life that is probably why they're not doing so well right now. Um, and promote pest predators. So uh, birds, wasps, hornets will eat thousands of bugs. Um, and even those stinging wasps that we don't like, they eat a lot of the cabbage loopers, earworms, armyworms, and other stuff that eat our eat our plants. And I'm going to show you a picture in just a minute of, um, I went out and, uh, well, yeah, I'll show you an example of this in just a minute. I don't want to, I don't want to uh, give, spoil it. I want to show it to you. So row covers are another uh, way to, um, if we have like a, a lot of grasshoppers in the fall, I'll throw um, a row cover or kind of an insect netting over um, certain crops so that they don't get eaten. It's just a physical exclusion. Then there's some that you can just hand pick off. Certain caterpillars and other things can just be, as long as you're out there doing your your daily garden walk or um, and, main, and, and seeing if there's anything eating them that you need to protect them from, you can pick off those things before they do too much damage and feed them to your chickens. And then there are natural homemade spray remedies. You know, at some point in time, once the population spikes to a certain degree and you've missed the ability to kind of nip it in the bud at a young, at a small stage, you can decide to intervene through, you know, a soap spray or some other spray to kill aphids. 
Um, but if you wait too long at some point in time, it's just going to, you know, you just need to call that plant and pull it out and then just, you know, plant something different, um, call it a loss. Trap crops can be helpful too. Certain crop, if you're having a problem with a really a particular type of pest, sometimes you can plant other crops that they really like to eat off to the side so that any bugs that are there go over and eat that plant before they come and eat the one, the plant that you actually want to grow. So there's a list of some household remedies for pest control that come from the Foundations for Farming training manual, milk spray, soap spray, flower spray, all sorts of things that even though they're natural, they're still killing stuff, right? So we don't want them to make them to be the crutch we rely on to compensate for our poor management. But it doesn't mean that you can't use them in order to salvage a crop and hopefully learn to do better next time. So dealing with large predators, uh, Fencing is just fencing and row covers can be effective um, for those in our area. We have a lot of deer, and I will go ahead and show you really fast our um, a picture of a fence. Oops. There we go. There we go. See if this loads. All right, here's a pretty little fence that we made around our well water garden by our house. So we just uh, used some saplings from our woods and some pipes and made kind of a little wattle fence. And that has done a good job of keeping the deer out. You know, deer, uh, at least in our area, they uh, could easily jump this fence, but they tend to not. Um, the smaller your garden, typically the, the less tall your fence has to be because they uh, don't feel they'd have to be kind of pressured into jumping into this garden because it feels a little more like a confined space. So um, this has worked well for here. So you can build simple fences, tall fences. But for a well water garden, we really want to think about what's going to be still pretty and aesthetic and pleasing um, for that. And then this here is what I was going to show you. I was out with some of my um, I think this was I can't I don't know if this is kale or maybe cauliflower. It's one of the brassicas that we were growing. And as I was there, there were all these um, caterpillar, you know, these cabbage worms hatching on this plant and eating some of it, but I couldn't find many of them. I was like, they're here. Like, I can see where they've been hatched and they've been eating the plant, but I couldn't find any caterpillars on it. And as I was there, this, I, I saw this yellow jacket um, bee come along and fly down, find a little baby caterpillar, grab it, and fly off with it. So I was like, that's where all the caterpillars went. The yellow jackets ate them all. So... It's amazing what God's put out there to uh, to take care of this. You know, if I put poison on this whole plant, it killed this this little fella here. You know, he wouldn't be there to take to help me with the job. Um, so just amazing to see God's creation at work. Go back to our screen two here. And then these are just basic um, things, you know, protecting from bad weather. Um, is something we have to consider, <clears throat> especially in certain parts of the world. So if it's hot, you got to protect um, tender crops from the sun, maybe through shade cloth or through other plants that you plant them underneath in the summertime. Protecting from wind actually is a really big thing. Um, you don't realize, so I didn't realize how much wind stresses plants and takes their energy. <clears throat> and just there were times that I would plant um, a crop in one of my tunnels even though the, I didn't have ends on it, just the, the temperature was the same, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't uh, exposed to the wind. And, you know, plants planted the same exact time in the, in the exposed to the wind and not, you know, one grew really big because it didn't have to deal with the wind stress. And one was very stunted and small because it was always trying to ride itself after being blown, you know, side to side. So that having windbreaks, um, a living windbreak is better, like of a of a hedgerow, than um, a physical one. It actually um, protects a further distance past it because it doesn't create turbulence. Um, protecting from cold, you know, making sure that you're identifying is there a site that's particularly susceptible to cold, or some sites that maybe have a masonry wall that is, uh, you know, releasing heat that's absorbed during the day or something. A lot of people in the past, you know, grew a lot of crops and in uh you know uh, the northern part of england and other places that they utilized um sites and and uh, microclimates to be able to grow things um in, uh, protected from the weather structures as well i love um utilizing greenhouses as um, some kind of structure to grow in in the winter time here in alabama makes it really pleasant and fun to do um 
you can use little structures that you put over your beds or you can you know have the one that you can walk into i prefer the one you can walk into just because it's easier to do than trying to uncover everything but I, i've started you can start with whatever you have so those are the first two p's and then the last p is picking our garden i mean it seems like a duh but i mean how many times i don't know how many times i have done all the work and then failed to pick it at the right time and it wasted <laughs> you know so it's like what's the point of growing all this stuff if i don't get you know finish the task and pick it and prepare it and preserve it in a way that allows us to benefit from it later i think you know some people have said that half the world half the food grown in the world never gets eaten it's wasted somehow before it gets to somebody that's going to eat it so we want to make sure that we're having minimal waste picking on time um with care and precision to a high standard not too late to ensure minimum waste and doing it with joy so part of that is don't plant so much that you can't harvest it when it comes time you know succession planting that's a really nice way to keep the harvest coming in where you're not having to pick you know a trash can full of green beans at one time during the summer and can it all why don't you plant green beans three or four times throughout the summer and within that window and then you know harvest a little bit at a time um so just a few things pick you know early in the morning before the heat of the day uh move into a cool place as soon as possible um, I like it's nice if you can set out up an outdoor sink or a really nice rinse area to to harvest your um, to harvest your uh, vegetables uh, or to rinse them before you bring them in the house and um, and just realize that like a lot of some vegetables refrigerators or or those kind of things are very dry and so that's where you need to put them in you know you need to maintain that moisture they'll get wilted in in a refrigerator I I find that removing the tops from root crops like carrots. Um, keep the roots from wilting. Otherwise, the they'll kind of pull that, the tops will pull the moisture out of their bottoms of the roots. Unless you're selling them as a, as a market gardener, everybody likes the tops on the carrots. So um, they're worth more money that way. So we would keep, keep the tops on the carrots if we're selling them. But if I'm keeping them for myself and want really fresh carrots, I'll take the tops off. So we have this um, well water garden stewardship sheet that you can also print off. And it just has some of these tasks that we've gone over, like checking the watering of the beds, checking the weeding, adding extra fertility, making sure everything's pruned, all that um, that you could use as a, as a checklist to kind of um, uh, pay attention to how you're doing in terms of your maintenance. <clears throat> all right. Now we're going into what I really wanted to get into, which is using our garden to share with others. Um, before we get into this, um, can y'all please in the chat uh, put, is there any, I want you to think about, okay, who is it that you can, that, that are some people in your sphere of influence and that you have a um, relationship with that God might want you to serve and share with some of the information that you've learned in this class? Um, and in the chat, if you could just write yes, that you have somebody in mind, or you could say, oh, it's my kids or whatever. You don't have to say who it is in particular, but I'd love you in the chat. If, think about, pray about, is there somebody that, 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 that's on, that the Lord might lay on my heart and who might, and, and I just write on there, yes, I have someone in mind or who, who that is so that we can kind of um, be thinking about that, those people as we go through this uh this next session so yep church community family neighbors community um great sounds like a lot of y'all are thinking about that some people say not not quite yet that's great i think the key is to be just saying okay lord who is it asking him who who do you want me to pass this on to or or sometimes he's wanting us to just be faithful ourselves first and then when we have something worth sharing, then he is going to bring along somebody. The idea is God can multiply uh, and use us to multiply disciples, but we have to focus, first of all, on being a disciple worth multiplying, right? <laughs> Otherwise, if he copies and pastes us, then it's not going to produce good stuff. You know, he wants to wait till there's something worth copying and pasting. Um, so great, great, great. Love, uh, love that y'all are thinking about this, because what I really... Um, wanting to do is <clears throat> invest in you guys so that you can reach more people than I could reach myself, right? 
that's what I we want that multiplication vision, that multiplication DNA. Um, and the same thing, I want you investing in people thinking about who is it that they can reach that you can't reach, right? And uh, and so it's not something that we force um, or pressure. It's just something we have in our heart that we want to be available to you to let God use us in that way. Um, and, so, and it's really about letting it be Holy Spirit driven because multiplication is, is something that uh, is really up to the Holy Spirit to do. Um, all right. So I am going to... You know, as we're talking about how can gardening help us to share with others, let me go here. And I'm going to share with y'all a very quick, short snippet of a um, film that I watched not too long ago. This is available on Amazon, um, and it's uh, this lady is talking about. Um, a, she is not a Christian, um, but she's talking about garden and how that um, has impacted her. So let me go ahead and share this really fast, and then we'll watch this one little part. Or not. It may or may not let me show it. If it doesn't, then that's fine. We'll just, I'll just tell you about it. Okay, it doesn't look like that's showing. Can y'all hear it though? If you can't see it, you can't hear it either. Okay, good. I wasn't sure if that would work or not. So basically what this lady says on here, and, and if you ever get a, a chance to look at it, it's called The Gardener. Um, it's a documentary, but this, this lady says, I'm not at all a Christian. I don't believe in God or anything like that. But when I'm in a garden and I see the beauty and, the, and, and, and all the plants and everything, there's something in me that wants to believe that this wasn't just all created by random chance accident. And it makes me want to believe that there's something like a creator or like a God that made all of this. And she's like, of course, that's not, you know, not true, but it's just, that's the feeling that I'm trying to communicate that I have when I'm in a garden. You know, she's trying to, trying to share how a garden's more than just a place. It's, there's something deeper spiritual about it, but it's interesting how even she, that that isn't a Christian can't get away from the fact that, God shines through his creation. And uh, and so that's what, as we're going and we're planting these gardens um, and we really try to reflect who he is through them, God can really, um, you know, draw people to himself uh, in in a way that um, is is kind of works well together with our own words and testimony that we share with people. So let me go back to here. All right, we're going to share the handbook again. So a lot of the a lot of the information for this lesson is in the faith foundations <clears throat> because of the faith element of sharing with others. Um and some of the key scriptures here are the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses and trust to reliable men who will also be qualified to teach others. That principle of multiplication that Paul was sharing with Timothy. And then whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. We can't just practice them and not teach them. We can't just teach them and not practice them. We need to do both. So spreading the message of Jesus as a gardener a well water garden is a practical way to share the love of Jesus in a real setting. So it does that in a couple ways. One, it gives us a physical place and practical way to engage with our community around meaningful and fulfilling work that meets real needs. I've had some people come to me and they're trying to do outreach into the certain communities, but there's nothing to, there's no physical place to connect with people around. You know, it's like, how, how do you hang out with your neighbor? You know, where do you do that? At what point do y'all come together to, you know, interact? And a garden provides a really good space to do that. And then second, it gives us a way to express the change Jesus has done in our heart in a way that people can see it and ask questions. 
Um, we want people to notice a difference. We want to be modeling something that they come and ask questions about, not just that we're going and having to tell them, hey, I'm, I'm different because I believe in Jesus. You know, it, it, they, there needs to be something that they see that's different that they come and ask us about. That, that gives a lot more credibility to what we share. And so I, I guess my approach, though, is not to say a well water garden is a sneaky way to slip in a gospel presentation and pressure people to pray a prayer to accept Jesus. It instead is an an, uh, an approach that is um, authentic, where we genuinely think about this garden in light of the gospel, and it's hard for us to even explain it without going back to that story, without that coming out of our hearts. And so it's not so much like, how do we have the right words to say, but it's much more about how do we have that in our own hearts so that when we speak it comes out. So really, if you from the beginning have started planting your garden and thinking about that and surrendering to the Lord from the very beginning and going to him every step of the way it is, as you've been doing this, then when people ask you about your garden, it's going to be a much more natural way to talk about it. You just share about how you think about it and why you're doing it authentically without trying to hide it or push it on people. Um, and so... <clears throat> Practically, there are several ways that we can we can begin to reach out and minister and share hope with people through our well water garden. So one is sharing, you know, practically gardening knowledge and food from our garden. And second is sharing stories of hope. So first, um, we can look for unplanned opportunities to share knowledge and food. And a lot of this these unplanned opportunities come if we're able to put our garden in a place that people can see it. So if you're able to put it, you know, where there's, you know, traffic walking by it, um, sometimes we put some, you know, down at the end of our road or where people on our farm pull up and they see it when they come up to our house. Um, or if it's at a church, we're going to be we're going to be putting it at our church right by the road where all the school traffic goes um, and or as people walk by. So it gives us opportunities then when they they come and they ask about it that we're able to share tips, share some, you know, some of what we're learning in the garden and uh, be like, hey, you want to try a carrot? They're really sweet in the wintertime, you know, um, because of when it gets cold, they're they're sweeter. And um, those are just unplanned opportunities that we want to set up our well water garden to um, facilitate. We can also set up an official class too, right, eventually. But we also want to be like, there in in a sense that we're open for and trying to position ourselves for those unplanned opportunities. And then learning to share stories of hope through our well water garden. Um, it you know, when we're sharing about Jesus, it doesn't mean that we're always telling the whole gospel presentation every every time, right? Um, we love it when we have those opportunities, but we should be listening for opportunities to sow seeds of truth through stories of hope. So, a story of hope is really just a testimony, a, um, a story about how Jesus is helping us. Um, they're like little seeds of hope that God can use to give people more of an interest in what you've experienced and what Jesus has done in your life. Um, and God's the one that can make those seeds grow. So first of all, we practiced when we practiced sharing the story of Brian Oldry, that's a, a story of hope that's kind of at the base of the well water garden itself about Brian's transformation and his story. And, uh, and that's something we can learn to tell and then learn to tell about the well water garden and the vision and mission behind it. And some of, some of the principles of, of, uh, that we've been applying, like the minimal tillage that might be, um, helping us with some of the solutions that we, uh, or the challenges we had faced in the past in our garden. Um, and so, yeah, so we can share the story of the well water garden is a great thing to practice doing. So when people come, you're able to um, tell that to them, whether it's just somebody stopping by your house or whatever. Uh, and then there's kind of the more ongoing stories of hope from your life. So these are the not just the normal ones, you know, the, like the one that's just standard of the well water garden, but things like challenges you faced recently. I want to grow a better garden, or I want to be more faithful in keeping my garden weeded, or I didn't know where to get compost, or man, the bugs are eating this particular crop. And then as we are walking with Jesus and we're going to him for solutions to these challenges we have, and he begins to help us, then we can 
share how he gave us a solution or share how he helped us to repent or shared how he gave us peace despite the difficult circumstances or helped us to rejoice even though the hail destroyed our crop or whatever. That's the kind of stories that we're able to share on an ongoing basis with people that testify to what God's doing in our life. And especially as we're going and we're talking to them and 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 they're, they are kind of like, well, I deal with that same thing too. You know, we're able to relate um, in a way that they can, um, uh, yeah, share in a way that they can relate to. And then those are kind of the org like the 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 ways that we can do it in kind of unplanned natural ways as people interact with our gardens or see what we're doing, or we just talk about them as people ask us about them. Um, because I tell you what, if you put a garden out where everybody can see it, like your whole community will talk about it. <laughs> um, remember that garden by the church? Remember that garden out there? What are you growing out there? You know, so it may not be by your garden, but it might be other conversations. And then uh, using your well water garden to train others um, is this is one of the the things that, you know, we want to cast a vision and equip you guys to do. Um, and it will, I think, as you share with others, eventually... Um, actually doing an actual training is a good use of time because sometimes you'll find that, especially if you're doing something that's worth looking at, that God's blessing it, um, or that it's just unique enough that people are interested, you'll sometimes have, you'll, you'll be challenged to like balance working in your garden or your other things in life and like sharing with people, right? So you just, it's better sometimes to be like, hey, I'm going to do a little class on Saturday, two weeks from now, you know, or I'm going to do a little, have some people come over and we're going to go over some stuff. And that way you can kind of schedule those times for follow-up to invest in people a little bit more deeply. Or you might have opportunities to do it at a local, you know, serve into some kind of local opportunity like we're doing with the local community garden. So you want to consider your audience. Um, I think we talked about this earlier with the Well Water Garden. If you're doing a community event, then um, sometimes it's a secular uh, context where you don't have as much freedom to bring the faith stuff in. And in that way, you can use the basic student lessons. However, what's cool is if you're at a church, like even if you have a community audience, if you're on your own turf at a church, you know, then you can use the basic lessons, but you can um, for them and maybe give them some of the faith foundations lessons and share that where you're not trying to push it on them, but you at least can be more free with where you're coming from. Um, in some of the faith stuff. If they're learning at a church, then they kind of are going to expect that anyways. But then your church audience is, you know, Christians that you're trying to equip with a Christ-like heart, biblical worldview, and practical skills for making an impact in their community. And sometimes Christians are some of the harder ones to talk to, you know, because they're like, what in the world does this have to do with, you know, the Bible? Or, or, or are you judging me for how I garden? Or those kind of things. But it's a really, you know, amazing opportunity to be able to speak into that and help people apply the truths of Scripture and just the principles of Jesus's heart to their life. And then there's trainers. You have people that actually want to not just apply it themselves, but want to go and train others. Or maybe you've, they've already applied it and they want to kind of have the next level of learning how to teach others. And you can also um, use some of the resources here and how to train them. So class formats could be anything from an informal workshop, just kind of like, hey, come over in the afternoon and we'll talk a little bit about how I'm doing the garden, to more of like a well water garden project class where you're going through the lessons, um, kind of like uh, we heard some people last night say that they're doing at their church. Um, there's some sample schedules at the end here that you can look at, but you also have to just figure out what works for you. So as a follower of Jesus, we want to be able to share the gospel. And that's something I would encourage you all to think about. Sometimes there's there, there was a time where my wife had an opportunity to share with them a, a family member who um, she was an in-law, but it was from China. And uh, we, she was talking about what they believed. And this lady was saying, I don't have really much faith. I don't know much about it. I probably would be a Christian if I knew what that was all about, but I don't know anything about it, you know. And so my wife was like, oh, you know, I, I should tell you about like, would you be interested if I told you some about what it means to be a Christian and follow Jesus? And she's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my wife realized, wow, I am starting from scratch. This lady has no background in anything, like anything about the Bible or whatever. And so she, I think she did a great, you know, a good job, but she realized how unprepared she felt to actually share what she would say is the most important thing in her life, you know, because sometimes we don't do it often enough to really feel equipped to do that. So we do want to make sure that we can explain the gospel if we do get that chance. You know, sometimes we're always like, man, I wish I could share the gospel. And then 
I remember this one lady in the parking lot one time, she was like partially drunk and she was walking out to the car next to me and she was just like, my whole life is, you know, unsatisfying. I don't know what's going on. I was just like, well, you know, you want, you know, and it's just like this gospel, like God's like, you better share the gospel right here. She's standing here telling you that her life is miserable and she wants some solutions, you know? And so at that point in time, you better have some, you know, prepare, preparation. So here there's this, um, these five gospel threads are something that I use and encourage you to memorize. They're based on um, a sermon series. David Platt um, preached one time on five gospel threads, but it's just this idea that these five threads of the gospel, you know, God is holy, just, and gracious, creator of all things, rebellion, man is rebelled against God. And, that's why we see all the brokenness in the world. Atonement, Jesus lived the life we couldn't live and died the death we deserve to die to make a way for us to be reconciled to God. And then conversion, it only applies if we turn from faith in ourselves and put our faith in what Jesus has done. And then eternity, our eternal destiny hinges on our response to Jesus. I keep this acrostic in my head and it makes it much very easy for me to, you know, to hit the points that are important if I'm wanting to go through all of them or the idea of weaving these gospel threads is sometimes you have a chance to weave one or two in a conversation. You know, you may be talking about your garden and talking about all the problems you're having, and you can talk about the brokenness in the world and why and, and weave in the thread about how it's really because of our broken relationship with the creator, you know, and maybe that's all you have a chance to weave in at that point in time. Um, but finding ways to weave these different threads in to our conversations um, as we're talking about the garden, even if we don't have a, not having an actual chance to go through a whole gospel gospel presentation. Um, and there's some more notes on that. And then here's just, you know, some thoughts about when this people are interested, we do want eventually to, you know, invite them to follow, to, to respond to Jesus's invitation to follow him. And there's some, some notes here on how to kind of think about um, how you might word that in light of the gardening stuff that you've been talking to about them. And then the multiplication in your community, we really want to be multiplying out um, where it's not so much about how many people you can train <laughs> as quickly, but it's about how you know deeply we can invest in people so that they can then start investing in people that we could never reach um, that are within their sphere of influence. So what we want to be doing is praying that God would bring along what we call champions. Champions are those who catch the vision and who are going to share it. Um, and that's where those are, that's the two people we're looking for, the two people per year that are going to be champions. We may share with 20 people, 40 people, you know, throughout the year that ask us about our garden or maybe even come to a class, but it's going to only be, you know, maybe one person out of 20 that actually runs with it. Does that make sense? And that's okay. We're just sowing the seed to find where the fruitful soil is that we can invest in further, um, which is what uh, Jesus seemed to do. Shared with a lot of people invested in the faithful, though. Um, and then uh, partnering with churches is a really great option. Like, you know, churches are already looking for ways to reach out into the community, to impact the community. And they have space. They have facilities for classes. You know, so this is really uh, not something I would encourage you just to do on your own, but try to find ways that you could partner with existing churches and ministries. Um, this this video that we have um is about the the church that uh, did the Wall Water Garden Project in Naples, Florida, is um, a really good tool if you're trying to share it with your pastor or church, and they're like, what? I don't really know. You know, if you let them watch this video, it can help them as a leader feel a little bit better about giving you a go ahead because they can see what it kind of looks like. You know, because they have responsibility about what they let their church do or not. And then again, not doing this by yourself, starting a foundations, you know, group of people, a Wall Water Garden group in your community. Um, where you can meet on a regular basis, encourage, do stuff together, help each other out with each other's gardens rather than just, um, you know, doing it all by yourself. Uh, and then finding ways to serve into, you know, um, non-Christian community settings like schools, gardening clubs, rehab centers, hospitals, nursing homes, homeless shelters, and all those kind of things is uh, are some really great opportunities. I know some of our students now are working in, with uh, veterans facilities and um, all sorts of things that if you're faithful, it's amazing the opportunities God will bring along. Um, there's some case studies here, everything from uh, a lady, a young woman in um, Georgia that um, works as, on her family homestead and is using this um, in urban area in, in Canada, um, a team in Indiana, the Florida. So you can read through some of those as examples. But one of the things we, al we always do in our trainings 
that um, <clears throat> is really, really helpful. And I would encourage you if you're teaching uh, students to how to teach to others is to divide up into groups and do role playing. So that means uh, we normally divide our, our trainings into two different groups and we say, OK, pick who your audience is, and then the other students are going to role play them while you kind of practice sharing, you know, while they walk past your garden or while they're coming and asking you about your compost pile. And then we kind of do a role play for a few minutes, like, hey, so your compost pile is nice. Yeah, let me let me tell you about it. And they'll kind of role play how they might interact with their neighbor or, you know, the commercial farmers in their area, or whoever their audience is. And, and then we'll kind of evaluate afterwards, like, how did that come across? You know, how, how did you weave in, like, the faith element? Did it seem too pushy? Did you not say anything about God at all? Were you asking questions of them? Or were you just all about, you know, and that little bit of role play can really be helpful at, for people before they go back home and they're actually talking to people for real um, to, to do as an activity. So then encouraging people to do have personal commitments um, of what they're going to do um, as next steps, which is what I'm going to encourage you guys to do. And then we want to, we don't have a very good system set up yet to track some of the growth of the Wall Water Garden Project, but we do have just a little form on the wallwatergardenproject.com.org slash report that you could go to if you wanted to report some of the stuff that, that you're doing that we can start accumulating so someday we can have um, some better, you know, reporting of uh, the gardens that are planted and those things. Um, like that. Let me go up here to, here we go, the last lesson. So if the basic lesson, so if I'm teaching um, into a, a community setting, I also want to be encouraging them to share this with other people as well, um, even if they're not Christians. And we talk about in the basic lesson, the joy and responsibility of generosity, of passing on what you learn or what you grow to others, sharing food with others, um, sharing gardening tips with them and humility, displaying the foundations in your heart. Um, humility, be a good listener. Admit that you don't know everything, but you're just humbly imitating the amazing design we see in nature. Don't judge other people if they have different techniques, but ask about them. Encourage the things they're doing well. Faithfulness, don't act like you're above doing the basics. Show your commitment to simple principles of doing things on time to a high standard with minimal waste and with joy. Emphasize the importance of doing small things well. And then unselfishness. Take every opportunity to serve others. Show that you care about them by sharing with them and including them. Be willing to show love to them even if they ridicule you, disagree with you, and don't appreciate what you do for them. So these are really great. You know, you can come even into a secular environment and you're sharing these things it's, and you're you're starting to disciple them and what Jesus cares about even before they might know Jesus. Um, and it points to him and what it is that that he wants for them and their need for him, really. And then you can teach them how to host an informal workshop and with tips for preparing for it and hosting it um, and uh, and then talking about becoming a garden multiplier. So this is kind of how, um, you know, the multiplication works. If you multiply at the rate of, of uh, everyone teaching two people per year, multiplying at that rate um, in uh, in year one, you would have four well water gardens because you'd have one person train one person and then the second part of that year they would each uh train uh, another person you have four at the end of that year um and then by 10 years you would have a million and in 14 years you'd have over a billion so this is to encourage us don't try to go do a lot just try to invest deeply in the people that you, that god does bring along and if you don't have anybody just ask him and I've had multiple people that have told us, they're like, I don't know where I'm going to get two. And next thing they know, they have way more than two. Um, so just just uh, be faithful and, and uh, trust God to bring along the people in his timing. Because sometimes it's a lot. Of, it, the, the, one of the, the biggest challenges is if all of a sudden you have 50 people that want you to teach them next week. That's a bigger challenge than trying to find <laughs> your first person because it's a lot more overwhelming. So be faithful with little, even in the people that you are training. All right. Um, now I'm just going to go over uh, a little bit more of the manual, show you a few pictures, and then we will finish up with some Q&A at the end here. So there are some links here um, under recommended resources. Um, we have the hoe that we recommend, at least here in the U.S., there's some garden planting schedule tools, seeds, um, and some of the links to foundations for farming there. 
If we go down to the trainer manual section, just want to show you a few of the resources that are on in the trainer's manual. <clears throat> we talk about um, the different uh, training formats, community or church or training for trainers things and kind of checklists for preparing for a training. Um, and then materials that you might need for the training. And then these are sheets for each lesson. So lesson one, the intro to the well water garden. If you're doing it for a community and just going through the basic lessons, it might take you 30 minutes. If you're going through it with a church and you're doing the founda foundations too, it might take you an hour. And then if you're doing a training for trainers, which a lot of times they'll be learning it and practicing teaching it back, you can budget two hours for doing this lesson with them. All you need is a classroom. Here's the different activities, materials needed, notes, goals, key themes, and a place for you to put personal notes to prepare for this lesson if you're preparing for it. So each of the lessons have this um, kind of training notes um, to help you prepare for that particular lesson. And then there are some sample schedules. So for instance, a community day class, this matches the link, the lesson link that are in those notes. So 30 minutes for interest and expectations, starting at eight o'clock, location, classroom, you know, not, probably few lessons, few courses that you're going to do are going to be matched as perfectly, but it just gives you a little bit of an idea of how you might lay out a day class for a community, a two-day class for church, um, which because you've got extra material to go through with them. And then if you're doing a trainers for training, it's basically a three-day training. Uh, and this is basically what we do on our farm in our five-day training. We just add other things, other topics and stuff in addition to this basic material here. Um, and uh, so it gives you at least a, a starting point. And then this is the training for trainers class guide because that extra hour when you're training other trainers is for bonus activities. So um, like for lesson one, there's some other introduction activities that we do. We do in-depth personal testimonies. Um, so some of these things take a little bit more time, but this is what I would do in a trainer's training. And these are kind of the bonus kind of supplemental activities that we would do in, um, in a trainer's training that's a little more in-depth. And yep, and that's basically it. We made it all the way through to the end. So good job for hanging in there, everybody. Um, let us now look at just a few of the last pictures that I've got, and then we will do some Q&A. All right. First, let's look at... I already looked at that. Sorry. Stop share. Try again. We're looking at uh, finished gardens here. That's what we're going to look at. All right. <clears throat> so here is my friend Nick and Anna Heisman. That they did a well water garden training in the UK. They're adapting the well water garden handbook for the UK setting. Um, and as you can see, the nice thing about this this is it's it's consistent. You start seeing you know the same you know spacings and and kind of layouts for each. Um, depending on the different circumstance, you know, situations, but they did a great job here and they're using mulch as their, I mean, compost as their mulch here. This is uh, here on our farm. That's the one that actually has the fence around it now. Um, this is uh, one at a veterans facility. It's some people we trained in March. Um, good friends did that looks way better than my well water garden. Here's one we did locally with students. Here's where mine is by my house. So you see it as you drive up. Here's what the one in the community garden looked like a little bit later as it was growing. There's this one that was up in New York that we put in. And there's in the community garden when it was a little bit bigger. So anyways, hopefully that gives you a little bit of an idea of what some of the well water gardens can look like. Let me see here. All right, before we go into Q&A, what I'd like you to do is, I'm going to give you just uh, just a minute here. And Lasagna, the book is available digitally. Um, you can email me and ask me for it, or it's available at the wellwatergardenproject.org. Um, yeah, you can, it's free digitally. You can get it and use it. Um, 
But I would like y'all to write down what is uh, one or three. Um, I, I would encourage you, what's, what's one action step that you can take that you feel like God might want you to take in, in order to take steps to apply and put to action um, some of the things you've learned this weekend? Doesn't have to be gardening related at all, but just what are some of the things God's laid on your heart What's one thing that he's laid on your heart to uh, to do in response to what you have um, done? You don't have to write in the chat necessarily, but if you do have something, you've written it down, I'd love for you to just write yes in the chat um, that you have an action step that you're going to take. And, um, and then I would encourage you to find somebody to share that with that can help hold you accountable um, and check on you to see whether or not you've done it. If it's something that you're willing to share in the academy or or with the group that's you know not so private or whatever that you're willing to share it, um, then it could be something that everybody else checks up on and and you can report and and tell us you know in a month how it's going um, and uh, and and that would be a good way for you to be able to be accountable to that. Um, but uh, just I want you to be thinking about right now what is that first step? We say yes. Amanda says yes. Um, Share share this resource with uh, someone. Um, yep, taking some steps towards uh, opening a greenhouse. Mary says, um, asking permission uh, to build a wild water garden at um, across the street. Yep, watch the composting training. Um, plan your garden with a friend. Compost. Um, have two friends that you're going to be accountable with. Great, great. Getting the garden laid out. Um, Yep, take steps to go through the Redeem the Dirt training. Yep. Um, investigate possible garden in a church land or nearby area. Um, awesome. Great, great, uh, great takeaways, guys. These are all uh, wonderful here. And I would encourage you, if you are if you are part of Redeeming the Dirt Academy, to um, to be able to... Give us updates. Share with us how it's going, um, and let us know how that goes. So love, uh, love the heart everybody has here, um, and I really appreciate y'all taking the time uh, to to be a part of this training. Um, I hope that this is just a uh, a kickstarter um, or a kickstart for um, your journey. Um, to continue learning, continue obeying, continue to learn what it is that God wants you to be doing and applying that better. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to kind of hang around for some questions and answers here and for a little bit, but um, also uh, encourage y'all, I don't know if I'll, I'll post it in the, the other chat, but we really feel like the Lord's called us to do these trainings um, as just a gift to the body and for free um, so that as many people can have access to them as possible. We do have to charge for them, you know, on site when people come here because of the, the expenses that we have for that. But we really feel like we want to make the Wellwater Garden Handbook a resource people can share with others and to be able to um, pass on um, and we don't want, we know that sometimes it, people are, the, the most fruitful people are the people that couldn't necessarily afford to come to something if we charged for it. So, um, but at the same time, we do have costs and expenses and stuff. So I will put a link um, in Redeeming the Dirt Academy. And also I'll just post it in the, in the chat here that uh, we have on our website. If you go to redeemingthedirt.com, um, I'll just share that actually really quick. Um, under, where is it? Donate at the top here. We have a support page. Um, we're not a nonprofit, so we don't. It's not tax deductible. But if y'all want to donate towards some of the trainings that we're doing and help us with some of those expenses and continue to do this for other people, then um, we would be more than uh, uh, grateful for any of that. But there's no expectation uh, for that at all. We're just very grateful for. Um, being able to do this, and God provides for us in lots of different ways that we are just always amazed to see how he continues to um, to just confirm us as we follow him. And that's what I would just encourage you guys is, you know, I was telling one of my sons who really wants to start a business the other day <laughs> or last night, he's like, wants to do all this. He's very entrepreneurial, but I just was telling him how so many of the, 
you know, opportunities that we've had and the ways that God's blessed us has been after we've just gone and served people for free. You know, we just go and just serve. It's just about like pursuing the mission God's given us um, rather than, you know, uh, pursuing the finances or those kind of things or waiting for it. We just want to go for it. And uh, and so as y'all go and do trainings, it's not a bad thing to charge for a training. A lot of times that does help people to have a little bit of a buy in so that they're a little more serious, even if it's just a little bit. So that's not something that that's wrong to do. Um, but it's just case by case. I would encourage you to just pray about how it is that you can serve those people um, and uh, and make it be where you're communicating that heart of generosity and service um, to them. And I think God will give you wisdom on what that should look like in your particular area and with the people that you're working with. All right. So I think I'm sure there's some questions that I missed back in the chat here. But if you have some, I'm open now for some uh, particular questions. Let's see here. Uh, we have Robin Lee said um, question about we do compost, but I'm not sure what to do with it. How do you apply it? Move the mulch to the side, spread on top, compost tea, several of the above. Great question. So if you have compost, we the place that we want to put it is on top of the dirt and underneath the mulch. So if you're going to plant um, and you have enough of it, you can just remove all the mulch from your bed, put it down on top of the dirt, put all the mulch back on top of the compost, and that compost is going to be in between the mulch, sandwich between the mulch and the dirt. Um, if you are, uh, and then you can plant through that mulch with transplants or open it up. And, and for all the y'all that are leaving, great to have you here. And uh, thanks for being part of the training. God bless for uh, um, for being here and I and, uh, hope you have a good rest of the day. Um, but I'll use compost um, either in bed preparation and also when I'm planting. So when I'm planting, I'll put it, you know, I'll open up the mulch, put it where I'm going to be planting and then plant through that compost um, into the dirt underneath. I like to compost as much as possible. I mean, I like to plant in the dirt through the compost because plants really like to grow in that dirt down there. Um, um, and compost tends to dry out uh, as far as if it's only in the compost. But that's, we also use it for top dressing. So we'll we'll put more compost underneath the mulch around the plants if they are, um, you know, have been there for a while and they need a little bit more fertility. And then we can also use compost tea is a way to take a little bit of compost and make it spread the benefits of the microbes over the whole garden. All right, let's see. Thanks, guys, for all your encouraging words there. Awesome that you like the new format, Aurora. Peter, God bless you. Let's see here. Okay, talk a little bit more about compost tea. So um, in the Well Water Garden Handbook, let me go ahead and just pull up that page really fast. It's going to be in lesson. Here we go. Uh, lesson. The compost lesson, which is lesson... Okay, lesson eight. And I'm going to share my page here in just a second. There we go. Okay. So this is the section on making the con the fertilizer teas. So chicken manure tea is what we're going to do for leaf growth. And we're basically just steeping it in a big bag, just like we would tea. And there's a, a time and ratios and style information for that. The compost tea here, um, then there's the comfrey tea, which is similar. And the compost tea is adding to our garden. It's a way, you know, compost is beneficial because it contains organic matter, which is a food source for the microbes and helps build soil, um, good soil structure, and the microbes themselves. So that's the thing. Compost is not just organic matter. You can have like a, a you know a handful of what looks like compost, but if it's dead because it's been suffocated in a plastic container or something else has happened to sterilize it, it's it's not living compost. It's not going to have the same benefit of bringing those microbes into your um, into your soil to be able to allow the um, um, them to be making the fertilizer from the stuff they're breaking down. 
Um, so those two together in compost are really beneficial. But if you only have a little bit of compost, what you can do is you can make a tea where you're putting that compost in some water. If possible, it's great to aerate it with an aerator, like a fish tank bubbler. But if not, you can just stir it, try to keep it aerated. Um, and once it starts to bubble and you can see that there's life that is multiplied in that water, then you can take that and you apply it. You have to apply it all at once because what happens is the microbial, all the microbes, they they reproduce and populate that water. And eventually they're going to peak and like die off. And it's not going to actually, it's going to be dead compost tea. So when you, when that compost tea is at the peak of microbial activity, you apply it to your, um, your garden, your plants, and that's going to boost the, uh, the, it's going to be adding the microbes even if it's not adding the organic matter, they'll be using the organic matter that's already out on your garden, your mulch or whatever's there. And some of the benefit of this is you can actually use it to um, combat foliar plant diseases. So a lot of times, you know, when you have um, the, uh, like a powdery mildew on your plant, if you put com free compost tea on it, it basically brings in so much life beneficial life to the surface of your plant leaves that it overwhelms the uh, powdery mildew and and gets rid of it which is amazing you're you're fighting that death with life um so so that's uh compost tea just is is a good general overall health thing and it's got all the dilution ratios and everything in the handbook here all right let me stop my share here go back to the questions Um, while I talk, I will share some of these example well water garden pictures again, because some of y'all are asking for those. I will, we are now getting enough pictures that I can, I probably need to make two, um, well water garden handbooks <laughs> or maybe a supplement to it or something, because if I add pictures like this, they're not very printer friendly. So one of the things I've tried to do is limit myself in the Wall Water Garden Handbook to drawings, you know, and simple images so that you can print them easily. Because if all you have is a black and white printer and you try to print this photo right here, you know, it's going to be like, bah, you know, not not really impressive. So we may make like, a, you know, a simple print friendly one and one with images might be a good idea to to create in the future. So another thing on the list. <laughs> um, let me hit some of these. So, all right. So we're saying not to plant near trees. Um, so this one person was saying the spot they're thinking about is next to an old stump of a tree cut down a few years ago that's died. Is it okay to plant near that? Well, you kind of have to do some research about what kind of tree it is. There are some trees that eliminate competition by secreting certain toxins into the root or out of the roots into the soil around them, like black walnuts, especially. Um, you want to be careful of that. So you want to pay attention to what tree it is, because sometimes if there's leguminous trees, trees that are actually good to plant near your garden, because they'll feed the plants through the soil. Um, but the biggest thing is uh, if you're not careful, because you're not plowing, if you have trees near your garden, they will send all their feeder roots up and they will stick it right there in your compost and take all that nutrients and water from your plants. And I've had that happen. I'm not like, I am putting so much compost on this bed. What is the problem? And eventually when I started digging down, I pulled up masses of tree roots that had dug in and were just sitting there in my vegetable bed, taking everything that I was adding onto it and being very grateful for it, I'm sure. But um, I had to get this, you had to make sure those trees are far enough away that you're excluding those roots um, if they are going to be a problem. Um, so if the seeds are planted in the soil and covered by compost and mulch, how do they survive at such a depth? That's a great question. So what we do is we plant, we make a furrow, we plant in it, we cover it a bit with soil and a little bit of, like I don't mind covering it with a little bit of compost, um, but I want it touching the soil. That makes sense. Like the fur bottom of the furrow is going to be the dirt itself because the moisture is wicked up and is right there available for the plant. Um, and then the mulch will not, we will not 
cover over the row. We will keep the mulch open until the plants come up and out and get bigger, and then we can tuck that mulch around the stem. So when we're covering the seeds, we're doing our normal planting depth, you know, two to three times the diameter of the seed is how much we're going to cover them deep. And then after that, they're going to, you know, we'll, we'll bring the mulch back in after we do that. There is, um, if you go to the courses on Redeeming the Dirt Academy, if you're a part of that, there is um, all those, the, the soil demos I showed earlier today, um, the soil demonstration video, that's one of the foundations for farming training videos. And those are all available on the Redeeming the Dirt Academy. And there's one there on vegetable gardening. And it has some videos of, of some of the different planting techniques that you could um, check on. Um, Cora, you're uh, asking about other composting methods that people could use that might be resistant to thermal composting or vermicomposting. Um, static composting is just where you put stuff in a pile and you let it rot, um, and you maybe turn it a little bit. It can be as simple as that. Um, and so that, or, or, or letting some, you know, animal manure age and then using that, um, that might be something that'd be just find what they, what does appeal to the people group that you're working with and see if you could come up with something that's going to have microbes and organic matter when it's decomposed so that they can use that. Um, asking about biochar, um, there, there are a lot of amazing soil remedying technique, like um, tools and stuff that we can use, whether it's biochar or it's all sorts of teas and inoculants and fertilizers and hugel culture and all those kind of things. Um, and I think that uh, um, all those are great, but we just find that keeping with compost as a simple starting point um, really helps to lay a foundation of soil health that will make anything else you do be benef like be that much more effective. And sometimes, though, we're trying to do super solutions for our soil where... Um, you know, if you add biochar or rice hulls, charred rice hulls for in, into a garden without the microbes, they'll actually be a vacuum and take my, you know, like tie up the microbes in the soil for a little while. Um, most anything that I want to add to the garden, whether it's biochar or any kind of um, mineral supplement, I want to, I'm going to add it to my compost pile, not to my garden. When I add it to my compost pile, the microbes make it so much more available that when I do put the compost on my garden, it's way more effective than if I had added that you know, uh, green sand or that uh, biochar or any other cool amendment that I have directly to the garden. So having that compost as a base that I run stuff through um, really is um, just keeps it simple. But it's kind of like compost is kind of like getting the lifestyle right. It's kind of like people be, you know, what essential oil do I need to take, you know, to improve my health? And it's like, well, you know, taking essential oils can be helpful, but if you're not getting enough sleep, drinking enough water, if you're not eating healthy and you're really stressed out, you're not going to compensate by just taking a few herbs. <laughs> you need to get those other things, your base, you know, like lifestyle healthy, and then some of those other things can be helpful. And the same thing is once we stop plowing, we mulch and we add some compost, it helps us to understand a little better where we're at in our garden so that we're not doing unnecessary things that are really just a management issue that that we don't want to be putting a band-aid on there um, by some kind of supplement to compensate for those things. It's kind of like start drinking enough water, getting enough sleep, eating right, and then see how you feel before you start taking a bunch of supplements. That's kind of the the approach that we want to want to do. Um Mary Ann said I can help with pen and ink sketches if you need this. That would be amazing. That's another way that y'all could support this project is volunteering with any skills that you have to make these resources more available to other people. And please email me if that's something that you would like um, to help with. Um, there's all sorts of needs we have for whether it's trying to come up with ways to help people report these things or coming up with better resources for teaching. Would love any of that. Um, quotes from George Washington Carver. There, I just honestly found all those George Washington Carver quotes, um, different places. Um, a lot of them are available online. I have a lot of George Washington Carver quotes or books myself. 
um, my, uh, my, one of my twins uh, that were born in 2020, his name is Carver after George Washington Carver and the Tuskegee Institute where they, he taught is just down the road from me um, here in Alabama. Um, so this garden right here um, that, that we're looking at, they did exactly like um, I showed you earlier in, in where they just dug the pads and they put it up onto the beds. Um, and then they put compost on everything and then mulched it. And we, we like to do a different, like what I normally teach and our students like is we like to do a different mulch on the pads just for aesthetic. Wow. You know what I'm saying? Like imagine if this garden was all the straw mulch, it wouldn't look as visually stunning as, as them using a different mulch on the pads. Does that make sense? So that's where. Um, it's a little bit like that, a little bit of applying that standard of excellence um, to it in order to uh, make it look to a high standard. James, great uh, to have you on here today. Um, Aurora, I don't have these example photos on here um, yet. I actually have just been going and pulling these out of my archives just for this lesson. So that's something I need to do. Um, let's see. Container gardening. Um, all right, so doing it in containers. Um, thanks, Adrian, for that. Um, yeah, so containers, you're going to have to realize that they are uh, much more dependent on you to feed them. So if you put, you know, you can grow in straight compost. I would like to still, if I have a container, layer it where I've got... Um, soil in the bottom and then i've got um okay yeah i'll move on to the next picture of the garden here sorry soil in the bottom and then some compost and then um some mulch on top of that but because of the um the limit of that pot you're going to have to um probably use some teas to supplement the growth of those plants because they're a little bit more dependent on you to feed them. Um, and so that's what I would recommend. If you don't, if it looks like they're not growing well, uh, go ahead and add some teas onto, uh, into those plants. Um, we've been growing some stuff in grow bags at our community garden up here. And, um, and we do have to just keep top dressing them in order for them to do well. And I just don't think they ever do quite as well as the stuff in the ground um once you get the ground right because it's there's so much that the soil adds to uh to um your plants that you don't get in a container but containers can still do really well so corn probably would definitely be something that would be challenging in a container um but yeah tomatoes and peppers and other stuff do well um in containers Yep, some other pictures here. And I will try to get these some of these other pictures up <clears throat> and available for you guys. Uh, maybe as a, some on the uh, Well Water Garden website, other other places. Um, but this would be a great resource for you guys. And um, Lasagna, you ask about vermicomposting. Yes, you can, uh, on an urban scale especially, um, you can... Uh, make compost or make your your fertilizer in a sense with a worm bin um, that you use worms to compost food scraps and then that allows you to do it on a very small scale um, in your area go back to the yeah there's that um so after the next season do you after the next after the season do you next season plant on top of the mulch no you always plant through the mulch into the soil um, the, the mulch is just the blanket on top, but it's always like becoming soil. Does that make sense? So you're always like in my soil in Alabama, we are adding soil. I mean, we are adding mulch multiple times a season because the soil just eats it up like crazy. Um, and, uh, and so a lot of times we'll, you know, there'll be not much left of the mulch from the previous season. We'll be plant, we'll add some more, maybe rake it off, 
And, and as your mulch decomposes, I'll use it for different things. Mulching is kind of an art. So I like to use bigger, chunkier mulch for um, bigger crops. And when I'm doing little crops with lots of little rows, I want finer mulch so that I can tuck it around those crops. And it doesn't, you know, you don't have a big leaf that's going to blow over on top of your little lettuce plant. Um, but if you got a big corn or, com or bean coming up, it doesn't mind as much to have bigger coarser mulch. So sometimes I'll move my mulch around in the garden, depending on what I need to use it for. Um, so I might have decomposed mulch on this bed from last year. I'll rake it off and it's nice and fine for uh, my carrots I'm going to be planting. So I'll move it over to my carrot bed and put some fresh, chunky new mulch on that bed if I'm going to be growing potatoes or something like that on it. Um, so it's a kind of an art to mulching um, that you'll learn as you go. Uh, Lasagna said, what are you starting underneath the mulch? Basically, we just have the dirt and then the compost that we, we're going to make and then mulch right on top, fresh mulch right on top of that. We're not doing a whole lot of lasagna layers. That's It's basically like composting on the soil, and that's a good method as well, but we're not doing that here because that can be a bit resource um, intensive to do that. And if you go in the woods, it's amazing. You have these lush plants growing, and it's literally a, that about that much mulch a lot of times about, you know, that much of a dark layer of compost kind of active, and then it's the dirt right underneath there. It's not like six inches often. Um, and uh, and so it's, it doesn't have to be as thick as you think. Um, what's the a good way to raise a soil pH? Mine's about 4.5 right now. Um, just as an encouragement, some of my soil uh, here was 4.8 when we started on some parts of our farm. So I'm definitely in the acid in the acid layer. You can grow some good blueberries for sure and in, uh, in that soil. Um, but uh, what's amazing about compost is it will balance whatever pH that you have. So if you have alkaline, it'll bring it more um, to the neutral and same thing if it's an acidic. But what I would probably do is, um, you know, wood ash or lime, if you're able to get some of that, you can put it directly on your garden to help with it a bit. But if you put that, if you're uh, if you end up making some compost, I would add either wood ash or lime to your compost pile, because the way that your um, microbes capture that and utilize it multiplies the effect of that lime or wood ash by fifty times. So in terms of its its effect on the garden. So if you take 100 pounds of lime and you put it in a compost pile and then you put that compost pile on your garden, it has the same impact as um, 5,000 pounds of lime applied directly to the garden. Um, because it we lose so much through leaching and all that stuff through the soil that microbes grab a hold of. And so it's not necessarily that it, makes more it just makes the effectiveness of it way more and that's why i always recommend if you have some kind of rock mineral or something that you want to add to your garden to affect something put it in your compost pile and then let that be the way you put it on your garden because it impacts it so much more um let's see um things that are uh, harmful to roots um, get hay for mulch that won't uh, see. I'm not sure about the boll weevils that are harmful to roots. I know um, a lot of the problems that I've had with, you know, you have root eating nematodes or other things like that. Um, it will, if you're bringing in lots of soil life, a lot of times um, fungus or other, there'll be some kind of predator that will balance those out if you're able to get it um, that way. But until then, you might want to just have to research what um, kind of thing you might need to do to bring that back into balance. Um, and then as far as hay goes, it doesn't have seeds in it. A lot of times hay does have seeds in it. Um, and uh, some of the, the hay that I put on my garden has it. I just had to pay attention to what is it is. Just a regular kind of grass that's probably out there anyways. Um, I don't mind putting that on there because I'm going to have weeds out in my garden anyways. But if it's a noxious weed, I want to make sure I don't bring that. And if you can find some way to cut your own material off your neighbor's land, you know, with a lawnmower or something um, to collect your own mulch, that's the best because you can then harvest it when there's no weed seeds um, and know that it's not sprayed with a chemical. So it's something you want to make sure that you are paying attention to whether or not you're getting materials that are sprayed um, with a chemical. 
And lasagna, you're asking about how much compost and stuff. Um, normally, we have some recommended rates for initial application. A lot of that's listed in the Well Water Garden Handbook if you're able to download that. And you should be able to have all that data as well there. Um, so Aurora, you're asking how much lime, what ratio? I don't know the answer to that question necessarily. It's uh, because it depends on your own, you know, the pH and how much you want to adjust it. Um, but the the I've applied pH early on in our farm. Since then, I've just applied compost. And when I have done soil tests, which I don't do regularly, but when I do, our pH has always been beautiful in terms of it's, you know, right in a six, six area. Um, and uh, so I've just kind of stopped doing lime at all and just, I don't even do it anymore. A lot of lime, we, we do teach that some in foundations for farming in parts of Africa, because if they've been using chemical fertilizer or they are using chemical fertilizer, it's always pushing the soil to an acidic direction. And so a lot of times if you're teaching them the first season where they don't have compost yet, how to use some chemical fertilizer in their little planting stations, we'll teach them to put lime in there as well to offset the acidic effects of the chemical fertilizer. But once you just start using compost, you don't really have to use the lime like you do when you're using the chemical fertilizer. Um, Cora, as far as using, like when some people have really fertile soil, should they still compost? Um, it's not going to be as important initially, but eventually you got to have some way to build that soil. So either you're going to use compost to in, to put back into the land or, um, you know, some other way to improve the soil, um, even if it starts out really good. Yep, compost, compost, compost. I found that, like, the more time I spend making compost, the less work I have to do in the garden, <laughs> honestly. Um, a clay and a mound left by the previous owner. Can I break it up and put it in the compost pile? Um, you could, um, but uh, normally we're not adding, like, you know, it could be a way to inoculate that clay and, and add a little bit of minerals back to your garden um, if you wanted to do that, uh, John asks. And Rob, uh, rabbit manure is... Uh, is is already in a form like if you have rabbits it's literally pelleted fertilizer it's already perfectly balanced you can put it right on your plants right as a fertilizer directly you don't have to compost it first so rabbits are a really great source of fertility um when you are doing your uh your garden so Jurgen, thank you so much and uh maybe i'll get to uh i don't know if uh if if I'll get to see you when I'm in, in Cape Town or not, but uh, it would, I'd love it if I if it works out. All right, everyone. Um, if you have further questions, please, you know, get on the Redeem the Dirt Academy or email me, or if you're trying to find the manual, I'll be glad to send it to you. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and um, pray for you guys and then send you off for the rest of your day. So um, let me stop this here. Awesome. All right. Lord, we just thank you so much. Um, uh, feels like you've um, been able to just speak to us and communicate uh, your heart for this and your heart for people. Um, we don't want to do anything that you're not calling us to. and We just want to be a part of things that you're doing. Um, just guide and direct us. And, um, and I just pray for each one of the students that were part of this that you would bless them, that you would protect them from discouragement, from the attacks of the enemy, that they would press through those things, persevere in doing good, because at the proper time they'll reap a harvest if they don't give up. Pray that they would, um, you would bring community around them, people that would encourage and support them and be with them. And I ask that you would uh, just give them um, just humble hearts to listen to you, to not make their own plans and ask you to bless them, but that they would just let you lead each step of the way and see you do more than they could ever think possible. Um, bring people, uh, give them faithfulness to apply and be disciples worth multiplying. Um, give them a hunger to know you more. Um, bring along people that will be impacted by their lives and that um, will take this message on further um, and share the hope of Jesus with others. And, uh, and we just ask that you would uh, do immeasurably more than we could ask and imagine. 
um, in a way that doesn't bring us any glory at all, but only all to you. And we just thank you that we get to participate in what you're doing, that you include us in your salvation plan to rescue the world. Um, even though you don't need us, you include us because you love us. And we just look forward to one day um, being with you in the new heavens and the new earth, um, seeing your restored creation and being able to tell the stories of what you did in our lives, Lord, that just help us to uh, to to love you that much more and we look forward to the fellowship that we'll be able to have one with another as well. And in the meantime, help us to fight the battle battle well, to shine his lights in this dark world, and to stand firm in the truth that um, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. In Jesus' name, amen. Awesome. And I will email the recording to everybody, um, links. So if you're wondering where to get the recordings, I'll post them on the Academy, and I'll email them, them out to you. So. All right. God bless. Thank you. God bless you, Noah. Thanks so much. And we will talk soon. All right. Bye.